On April 1, 2011, a debate raged inside the Texas Capitol. Republicans had swept the previous year's elections by promising to reduce state spending. Social conservatives saw an opportunity in the state's budget battle to divert funding for family planning services, and in particular, Planned Parenthood, to anti-abortion causes like early childhood intervention programs and crisis pregnancy resource centers. So you're taking away from family planning services, which shows to be cost-effective and preventive to give to this alternative organization that's not even regulated. We want to protect a whole lot of people, and I would say that the most innocent amongst us certainly deserve to be protected. Democrats, outnumbered in the House, were powerless to stop the cuts. Cuts that meant about 180,000 poor Texans, the majority of them women, would lose access to birth control, breast and cervical cancer screenings, and testing for sexually transmitted diseases. By the time lawmakers adjourned in June, they'd slashed family planning funding by two-thirds, from $111 million in the previous biennium to $37.9 million for the next two years. Their unprecedented move could have long-term implications that many are only just beginning to understand. The cuts took effect on September 1st. Out of more than 70 Texas family planning providers, 14 immediately lost their state funding. By December, the number of providers was down to about 40. In a May 2011 memo that does not reflect the full extent of the state's final reductions, the Legislative Budget Board, a nonpartisan body, estimated such a sudden shift could lead to at least 20,000 additional Medicaid-funded births in the coming years, at a cost of more than $230 million to taxpayers. Whether that will actually happen is a question a group of experts are trying to figure out at the University of Texas at Austin's Population Research Center. So you can really see across the, the range of experience. Led by veteran demographer and sociology professor Joe Potter, the Texas Policy Evaluation Project formed last fall. They've started collecting surveys and interviews with clinic directors. Yes, we do kind of care what the different funding streams are. The small group meets weekly on campus and includes experts from out of state and graduate assistants like Amanda Stevenson. We went from having a program that provided relatively accessible contraceptive services at almost no or no cost to a broad population of women with low incomes to having much, much less. Over the next three years, the UT group will gather statistics on unintended pregnancies, births under Medicaid versus private insurance, and the economic impact that may be associated with entitlement programs like food stamps and children's Medicaid. They're also studying abortion trends and postpartum experiences for women trying to access birth control after they've had a child. The bigger the change in the policy, the greater the chance you can somehow connect it to uh, to the change in, in behavior, change in fertility, change in contraceptive practice. But it's not an open and shut question, and I can't approach it as that. I know that some of my colleagues that say it's not going to make much difference, and if it does, it's going to be a short-lived difference. And I have other colleagues who, who believe it could make a substantial difference. And the reason that it's an open question is that it may be the case that people get those services another way. They may reallocate their personal finances to you know, pay the 50 bucks a month to get the pill or 150 bucks a month, depending on the method that they want. There's all kinds of stuff that people can do to meet their needs. And maybe they'll do that if the government won't pay. Potter and Stevenson say they won't know the full extent of the fallout from the budget cuts until 2014. For now, their early surveys indicate clinics are reacting to the changes in vastly different ways. One of the biggest things that has come up with these in-depth interviews is that more women are now being expected to pay for services. Some are finding alternative funding sources. Others are limiting the types of birth control they offer, especially long-term methods like the IUD. Planned Parenthoods in Dallas, Austin, and Waco are merging their operations and resources, just one effort to defend themselves. I thought maybe the initial period would be a relatively small adjustment, but in fact what we're hearing is that there was a a substantial shock to the system from day one in that the uncertainty is another is another 
constant. Potter strays from talking politics. He says his group's work has to be impartial and will be judged by peers in the academic community. That's less of a priority in the Texas Capitol. On and off the presidential campaign trail, for example, Governor Perry has praised the effects of spending less on family planning. Last year, I proudly signed a budget that ended all state funding for Planned Parenthood in my state. Since then, there's been about a dozen of those clinics that have shut down. I think what's so concerning about Texas and what the governor's agenda has been in Texas is that this is the, this is the first state we've seen where 300,000 women really overnight have been thrown off of not only family planning, but let's remember, this is also the services they get to get breast cancer screening, to get pap smears, to get their basic well women checks. Though Planned Parenthood was the obvious target of lawmakers' ire, its clinics are not the only ones feeling the pinch. One of the participants in the UT study is Carol Belver, the director of Community Action Inc. of Central Texas, a San Marcos women's health provider that never performed abortions. In targeting Planned Parenthood, they also threw out independent people like Community Action that provide services that have never done abortion, that have just um, plugging away quietly doing our work helping men and women. How did community action and dozens of other family planning clinics get caught in the crossfire? Though taxpayer funding for abortions is already prohibited, lawmakers last session wanted to make it even more difficult for Planned Parenthood to receive any public financing for its preventive services because it provides abortions at some of its clinics. The state of Texas is not interested in uh, proliferating the abortion business. To force Planned Parenthood clinics out, Republican lawmakers created a tiered system that places public providers that offer comprehensive care, such as local clinics and federally qualified health centers, at the top of the priority list for family planning funding. Specialty reproductive health clinics, like Community Action Inc. and Planned Parenthood clinics, are in a lower tier. As a result, we have been on a roller coaster ride. In September, the state offered Community Action Inc. grants from a mix of state and federal funds known as Titles 5, 10, and 20. Three months later, the state zeroed them out and diverted that funding to providers in higher tiers. We had to close three clinics in the rural areas, and now we're down to two. We have had to lay off 11 staff members. Some of them have been with us 25 35 years. Without Title X status and the discounted rates that come with it, Belver says her clinic's birth control costs have shot up 100 percent. Janie Vargas, an area clinic manager for Community Action, says on the front lines she's dealing with constant uncertainty, low employee morale, and patient confusion. A lot of our women are low-income women. A lot of women, you know, if they go to a doctor, you know, they, a lot of our patients get very intimidated. You know, and they've been coming here for so many years that they feel so comfortable. Vargas and Belver say the roller coaster ride continues. They're waiting to learn the fate of a different source of funding, the Medicaid Women's Health Program, which for many clinics is the only remaining public subsidy available to about 130,000 very poor women in need of birth control and cancer screenings. We start from the shared embrace of three guiding principles. Perry announced in March that the state would reject the federal government's matching funds and take over the $35 million a year program if it could not exclude Planned Parenthood providers. He has yet to identify where the funding will come from, but health officials promise clinics won't notice a difference. Meanwhile, there's no indication lawmakers will restore the cuts they made to regular family planning last session. Enough is enough with the attacks on women's health care in the state of Texas. Beyond the political arena and the struggling clinics in the field, Potter and his team at UT Austin say their mission is to keep close tabs, stick to the science, and keep open minds. If the government is spending its money in a way that doesn't actually help anyone, then I, you know, as a citizen, don't want it to do that. But if the government should be spending its money in a particular way because it improves the lives of the people in my community, then I care about that too. Like, I care about answering that question as a citizen as, and as a social scientist. Whatever the results, their study could help determine whether the policy changes lawmakers implemented were right for Texas and its women. Reporting in Austin, this is Ton Tan with the Texas Tribune.